said, you know, that's exceedingly impressive when you have a car that doesn't cost mm -hmm. $100,000. Right. Right. That's yet harder it's, to do. It's just, it's just such a... a the good, amount of content. And it's, the... Just, and it's just a good piece of engineering. I mean, it's just like, so, so I said, you know, and, and in certain cases when you see that, I mean, that's more surprising than being in an A6 and seeing all the technology, right? Because it's a certain expectation. Mm -hmm. But when these guys competing <clears throat> bring it to a new level, and I mean, and, and you know, you look around, and and again, I mean, they're not using, you know, uh, Napa leather or any of this sort of thing yeah. in it. But I mean, yeah. it's just like someone mm -hmm. carefully chose what is being used throughout the vehicle, right? I mean, right. you get you get the sense that it was it was done deliberately, mm -hmm. not done because they had to do it. And right. uh, um, so, I mean, something like that was, I thought it was very impressive. Uh, uh, you no, know, along those same lines, uh, I was really impressed by the Toyota Corolla. Just mm -hmm. one example. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, and what really hit me is, uh, I came to a, a stoplight, and I'm sitting there, and I thought, um, I thought the engine shut off. But the engine, the tax at 600 RPM. It was, and it was that smooth? dead quiet. Yeah. I thought the hatchback you thought you had Corolla? the start stop yeah, or hatchback something. Corolla, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was just like, man, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. It's that quiet and smooth mm -hmm. for a low end car. For a low end car, it's good. It's right. good look. It's a good looking car. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm knocked out by the Santa Fe. That one really impressed me. Mm -hmm. I was just in the Navigator this week. Yeah, and that was like. This is legitimately nice. Yes. Like it's not nice, but it's not right. nice uh, if yeah. only. It's yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Well done. It, it, yeah. it surprised it's, a lot of people. Yeah. It's big enough to live in. It is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> big enough to have its own have zip code. Family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man, this thing is enormous. Yeah. If you don't have a family, you can start one. Yes. Yeah. Right. Navigator. Right. Well, I find the older I get, the bigger I like them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love those big cars. <laughs> So, yeah, to me, it's so valuable to go back to back to back. Mm -hmm. You know, you hit the same roads, you hit the same bumps, I hit the same railroad crossing mm -hmm. at the same speed, you know, same full throttle acceleration. And, and you're probably still find, having trouble finding a distinction from one to another. No, 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 oh, not I, at all. Not oh, really. Okay. No, 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 no. It, 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 when, when you start doing that, you know, bang, 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 then one after the other, that. you go, yeah. oh. And... Uh, some cheap cars impress, some mm -hmm. expensive ones don't, but, right. but generally the expensive ones are nice. <laughs> the cheap well, ones are. They cheap. better be, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's an advantage of the Mama Spring Rally. You've got them all right mm -hmm. there. You can jump yeah. right from one to another. Right. And I'll tell you, the one that least impressed me was that uh, Regal Wagon, the Buick. The, mm -hmm. uh, boy, it just didn't seem like a luxury car. Mm -hmm. It just didn't feel like it. It wasn't For the price. Like, well, and of course, this was the, probably the lower trim level, too. It's, I don't, it's, it's uh, a premium car. Not it's a pre yeah, premium yeah. car. Yeah, not a luxury car, but a premium car. I but it didn't feel like, like a premium car. But um, it's, it's kind of pricey. It's functional, right? It's, yeah, right? It looks great. It looks uh, fantastic. I haven't driven it, but the interior didn't look I, I, all I, that impressive. I was, I, was cause I, I drove it yesterday, I think, and uh, the interior, the, the, the material that is used for the um, covering the dash, I mean, it's mm -hmm. some, some plethora of some something, just, yeah. you know, and, and, and it just it just looked like <laughs> oh, all black, <laughs> made out of turtle shells or something, <laughs> maybe or some new material, <laughs> ninja turtle shells. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna go live here, or you know, start the show. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us for Autoline After Hours. Special you, Gary. Hi, it's good to have you. Yeah, here. I, I missed the show last week when you guys were doing the Ford Edge yeah. out in Park City. I think you guys were. Yeah, uh, Park City, there. Utah. Yeah, and uh, it feels like Park City, Utah, out there right now. It's a uh, it's a lot <laughs> chillier here than it was a week ago. Indeed, that's for sure. Absolutely. 
Hey, we got to let everybody know that Steve Purdy is joining us. He's with Shun Piker Productions, which puts out the Shun Piker Journal. That's Steve, right. Great to have you here. Oh, my pleasure indeed. So explain Shun Piker. There's well, a meaning behind that. Yeah, Shun Piker, for those who don't know that term, is one who shuns the turnpike, mm -hmm. takes the back road instead of the highway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do is focused on road trips and back road mm -hmm. kind of stories and and uh, places you don't often go and see, but always with an automotive element there you're, you're probably dating yourself, saying <laughs> the word turnpike. Turnpike, that's, <laughs> that's true. The highway, staying off the major highway. Yeah, well, turnpike so. tends to be more of an East Coast kind of term. Yeah, I don't even know true. if they use it there anymore. Yeah, probably not. You're an old rallier too, right? Well, yes, I've done... Press on regardless rally? Well, I covered the POR a few times. Okay. I rode through a few press stages that... Uh, Kind of You're still sure. recovering from it? Oh, yes, that's for sure. But yeah, I did the uh, One Lap of America rally seven times as well. Wow. So uh, that was a lot of miles. Mm -hmm. And we never did very well, <laughs> except for one year when we had a really highly skilled computer guy as our navigator. But boy, uh, you know, put me behind a wheel, but don't put me in, uh, in a column of figures trying to calculate time, speed, and distance. So when you did the, the One Lap, mm. did you go on the turnpike? Oh, yes, we sure did. <laughs> well, let okay. me tell you quickly, the route instructions for the first one, we left from Darien, Connecticut, and the route instructions said, go to Boston, turn left, to Seattle, turn left, to San Diego, turn <laughs> left, to Miami, turn left, and back to the start. That was the route instructions. <laughs> and uh, if you stayed on the, on the turnpike, on the turnpike, on yeah. the freeway, and uh, went along at a pretty good clip, you could have time for a shower when you got to the next turn, and, and uh, just kept going. <laughs> so, yeah. That's great. But our special guest today is Craig Cole from Auto Guide. Special. That's well. Right you're the guest, man. You're sitting in the guest chair. Oh, is this? I didn't realize. Yeah. Oh, I was over there last time. Yeah. That's right. Oh. <laughs> you weren't special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we made you special for well, this thank show. Thank you. Because you brought better. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Props and goodies and a giant hunk of pig iron. And we're going to talk about that. In fact, we're going to be talking about the Ford Flathead V8. And if you all who are watching would like to get in on the discussion. Send us an email with your question. Shoot it to viewermail at autoline.tv. We'll also take phone calls. That number is 620-288-6546. <clears throat> and if you're outside of the U.S. to make that call, it's what? Plus <laughs> zero, zero, <laughs> one, one, whatever. So if you guys figure it out. <laughs> but uh, back to the show. What got you to be a fanatic, I guess, a fan of the Ford Flathead V8. I don't actually know. I think I'm just an old soul, right? Because <laughs> I've always loved old cars, like old cars from the 30s especially. They just look so cool. Nothing's like that today. I think the styling back in that era was was really different. Each brand you could sort of tell apart, where today you put a, a mid-size sedan profile out, out there and you don't know what car. Is it a Corolla? Is it a... Is it a Honda, you don't know. I mean, everything kind of looks the same. But back then, big differentiation. And I was fortunate enough to be able to, to restore a 1936 Ford, which I was going to drive today to bring in studio, but I had to go to an event this morning and just with the rush hour, yeah. I didn't want to deal yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah, right. I brought the engine block instead. So you took it out? <laughs> yeah, and, no, uh, this, this is one of my <laughs> spares. Oh. So how many pile. spares do you have? I have, well, more than I'd care to admit, probably six or seven. Because they Full do, engines? Well, yeah, that have been torn down, but most of them are down to bare blocks like this because uh -huh. they have to take them out and get them uh, hot tanked, basically cleaned out, and then checked for cracks because they do. They are notorious for cracking, which can be fatal. Why? How, why, why do they crack? Well, a lot of times they run very hot, which is something we'll probably get to in a minute here. But they run hot, and then also between the two valves, you've got alternating hot and cold, mm -hmm. and that can tend to stress the metal there. Also, if you get a steam pocket under the valves there, it'll crack because it'll be superheated. You're not getting the coolant flowing through that area, oh. and it can crack. This engine so, came out when? 1932. I believe March of 32 was when they announced it. it it's not the first V8. Oh, no, not at all. But, in fact, Chevrolet had one in, like, 1917 with overhead valves. Yeah, Ed, Chevy Ed, or Cadillac? Chevrolet. Really? Chevrolet had an overhead valve. But, but this could be the, the, the Ford Flathead is the first mass production V8, exactly. right? Exactly. That's the key. It's the first popularly <clears throat> priced V8, if you will. And it really, it was a response 
um, really to Chevrolet, because in 29 they came out with a straight six that was the price of a four-cylinder, mm. and Henry Ford was not going to allow that. He loathed the straight six from a car that he built many years ago. He hated the engine for whatever reason. I guess it would rip up the transmission. So he never liked the straight six. So he's like, ah, we're going to come out with a V8. We're going to two up Chevrolet. But did, didn't he not want to have a V8? That, that his son had said at one point, we need to have a V8. Mm, and he's like, that oh, I'm not sure about. We, we I think can't, we Edsel can't do would have gone six instead. Here we got a picture. That's not your. That's a, no, that's a 32. You, you got a four door. I do. You know that? Right. It's a 36. Okay. There you There's go. There's your car. Whoa, That's that is a good-looking car. Isn't that pretty? Mm-hmm. No uh, kidding. And every, every nut, bolt, bracket, component, everything's been gone through, and I've refurbished, cleaned, replaced. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> but... I'll bet you could do this blindfolded, right? They're it, fairly, yeah. They're, 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 they're fairly straightforward. Yes, they're fairly simple. And, um, I mean, I brought a bunch of components we can talk about later. But right. the real heart of the engine, the real innovation that Ford did was the block itself. Because now, they, I always heard, you can confirm this, I hope, that they could not cast this. Right. And Henry was out there with right. practically a whip. One Saint out of two keep going at it. Yes. One out of two had to be thrown away. Yes, yeah. there are, because melted down again because they we failed before they got to the car. Is that right? Yeah, how failed they, testing. How did they fail? Uh, the During, cracks mostly. The boundary, I think. They, yeah. the cores would shift and the block would be useless. I yeah. mean, if you can't, if you bore it out and you hit water, yeah. what good? Are you you got to send it back and scrap it. <laughs> yeah. So the big innovation here, uh, prior to the flathead V8, every V8 was found pretty much in luxury cars, high-priced vehicles. And that's partly because they had to make them in separate pieces. They didn't have the foundry technology to do them in one single one block. Oh, exactly. single block. Whereas the, the others were, you know, you castings have, that were take, bolted take together. A four and exactly. Well, you have a crankcase, and then you'd have a separate casting with the cylinders and then the intake and everything. So you'd have to machine all those surfaces. You'd have to hold those tolerances, and you have to assemble it. So there's all this work that goes into it. Henry Ford, through sheer force of will, I guess, got them, Charlie Sorensen is cast iron Charlie, one of his engineers, to, to design this engine and produce it and get it reliably done in one go, which brought the cost down enough that they could put it in a low price car to compete with Chevrolet. Sorensen was a manufacturing genius. Yes, yes. You know, everybody gives Henry the credit with inventing the moving assembly line. It's probably Charlie Sorensen. Yeah. And I mean, even like Oldsmobile was or doing. Or Oles yeah. did it before Henry yeah. Ford did. And didn't his factory, yeah. like, was it in Flint? or? Was well, it? no, it was in Detroit and it burned down. Yes. Right. And that's when he moved to Lansing. Ah. Uh, so, so, so now he's. Ransom Oles. Ransom Oles, R.E. Oles, yeah. yeah. And Henry Ford worked for R.E. Oles. In did he Germany. really? Yes, yes before I, he established no. his second company. Huh? He worked for R.E. Oles. He had three goes at the auto industry, right? right. At least. Who gets one yeah. chance? Yeah. Little and three right. and he started right. a car company, yeah. right? And I understand that this, uh, the Flathead V8 was one of the last automotive components that Henry Ford oversaw before mm -hmm. he moved on to all the other things that interested him in life in the mid-30s. But this was one of his last projects. You could, and that he had four teams working on it at one time. Exactly. And one team would come up with something he didn't like, so he'd just dissolve them and start another team. He didn't, I mean, he didn't even keep what was good. Yeah. So it was quite a, quite a story. He was an eccentric guy, he was. say he was. the least. Yeah. Bit yeah. of a tyrant. Yeah, yeah and that too. And, yeah. Yeah, so. But the block is the real foundation, and that's, that's the innovation. They had something like, I want to say, 50-ish sand cores that you have to line up when you're, you're setting the mold up. And there's a, they brought a picture up. So you can see all of those bits of sand. They're carefully molded. That's like a negative. That's the reverse of the engine. So wherever there's a sand core, when you pour the, the liquid, the, the molten cast iron into the mold, that's where there's no metal. So basically, the water jackets, the intake ports, everything. Um, so you have to make all of those in reverse to be able to manufacture the engine, which can you imagine trying to figure that out with a slide rule and everything? <laughs> Mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, hey, we got some questions here. Oh, already, well. Dan Neal. Okay. The Dan Neal wrote wow. in to ask, is it true that Henry kind of sabotaged his own engine? I'm hmm. not sure about which that. Which goes sabotage. My point. Why would he sabotage his Because he didn't want to do V8. It, well, yeah, and he didn't want somebody else's idea to succeed, maybe, although it was, I mean, he worked on it, so. But, you know, he was so eccentric that I guess I wouldn't doubt that, you know? 
He was. Uh, well, and, it sounds like, like well, from what you're saying, maybe he was against it at first. Right. And then and somehow he got sold on it. Edsel yeah. or somebody sold him somebody. on the idea. Well, they were working on an air cooled X8 at yeah. one point. That's right. Yeah. Which I can't imagine. It's almost like a radial aircraft yeah. engine of, you know, of sorts. Yeah. But I know with the flathead, initially he wanted it without an oil pump and without water pumps because right. just like the Model T, it kept costs down. It was very mm -hmm. simple, easy to maintain. But. Uh, because of the... Can you imagine the cracking problem that it had because of, <laughs> you can't. know, the cooling was, was <laughs> bad and... and <laughs> that's oh, we didn't need a water pump. pump either. You know, yeah. it's just like... What, <laughs> yeah. That's why it has full pressure lubrication and not one, but two water pumps. Why? Like on the front of the block, you'll see a couple of giant holes. That's where the pumps bolt to. And, well, very important reason, John, because these are notorious for running hot. And if you look at the way the valve train is arranged and the way the gases flow into and out of the engine, you can see on top, those are the intake ports. Mm -hmm. the, the air and the fuel flows into that, up, down, into the cylinder, very torturous path, which is why these engines yeah. do not breathe very well and have very much power, but <laughs> that's another story. Uh, but when, once uh, you've had your power stroke and the, the air and fuel has been burned, it's got to exit through another exhaust valve and it routes around and into the block so these hot, hot exhaust gases are being dumped right into a water jacket, very first thing, which obviously puts an enormous strain on the cooling system. Mm -hmm. um, they had something like my car is five and a half, six gallons of coolant in the, mm -hmm. in the whole system. It's just huge. Uh, and that's just to keep the temperatures in check because they, they routed those exhaust ports right through the block. Okay, but was, is, is, is your cooling system stock? I mean, or, or is that something that came about later in the uh, life of this thing. I mean, the, the engine ran for 21 years, mm -hmm. so modifications were made. Yes, so I'm running, this is an, uh, sort of a mid-range production block. So this would have been like 46, probably 48, somewhere in that range. And they made a number of improvements to it. Uh, the early engines uh, were 21 stud, they were called. There were 21 studs that held the cylinder heads down to the deck. Uh, and they also had the water pumps mounted up on the cylinder head. So they were trying to suck hot coolant out of the block, which didn't work so well. It would just lower the, t the pressure inside the block in that area and could cause more overheating. So with the mid-range block, they added 24 studs per head instead of 21, and they moved the water pumps down to the block where they would force cool water into the engine rather than trying to suck it out, which did help a lot uh, with the overheating issue. But a major reason, another one that they overheated, they didn't do a very good job knocking the, uh, the core sand out. I've taken engines apart, and the back two cylinders are half filled with sand still, aside from all the rust and scale and other crap in there. I've pulled pieces of rusty wire out that they use to hold the, the, uh, the sand cores inside the mold. That sounds they like just, bad quality control. They just didn't, yeah, they didn't care. You know what it sounds like to me? Souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring you some rusty yeah. wire next time, Gary. Put it in a frame. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Dave Tuttle has just written in to oh. ask, what were the other technology, design, or manufacturing breakthroughs mm. that finally made the flathead viable? Metallurgy, casting techniques, milling, Block design features, pistons mm -hmm. or rings? I think the big, the big thing was the casting technology, to, to be able to make it in one piece and save all of that machining and assembly time. That was the big achievement with this engine. Um, obviously, there are trade-offs to the design, but they eventually ironed everything out, and this was in production for 21 years at right. Ford, a year later in Canada up until 54, and then they actually used the 85 horsepower block, which is the standard size, up until I think like 1991 in France, in, actually. Right. They put them in army trucks, and if you can get a French flathead block, they're the best, because <laughs> they have the highest, they have, much, they have more advanced metallurgy, they have better casting techniques, they knocked all the sand out, and they're just, you know, they've, they've benefited from all that experience, of decades of making them. Daniel wrote back to clarify. He says, uh, I mean by insisting on unworkable ideas, <laughs> such as bad gas flow and uh -huh. <laughs> bad coolant flow. But he also asked a really good question here. Why are we celebrating this hunk of junk? Why has this engine persisted? Well, I can give you one reason. Soul. Why, a, why, why well, Steve? I, I think one of the reasons is that this is the engine that sort of defined the hot rodding, hot rodding in the early oh. days. After World War II, when everybody was excited about cars and you couldn't get a new car, 
you know, these California guys would just build their own cars, and there were more flathead V8s around I, I, I get than that. just I get about that. anything else. That was else. 70 years ago, mm -hmm. right. damn oh, near. Oh, and why are we right. celebrating it? Well, so, because of its historical significance. Yeah, I know, I but there's other historical engines, right? Well, and, sure. and there's people, but more, a lot of people like cool. Craig who are cool. Yeah. We don't know them. Cool. We know him. Yeah. Yeah. And you know I'm not cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. But, but to why do we celebrate? I don't know. It's nostalgia. It's it feels good inside. Well, but it, yeah, it, it right? is it, it is significant from the point as mm -hmm. you noted earlier that this became the first V8 that was mass right. produced yes. and mm -hmm. affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in in that regard, it's significant. Now the the it's, other thing is uh, the crankshaft, as you may be uh, familiar with. That mm -hmm. This was this was an innovation that. Uh, the other vehicles had used forged steel, mm -hmm. and he did cast steel. Well, I think initially the, some of them were forged, but eventually. But then he decided yeah, that he needed for to, cost. And, yeah. and, and, and he well, he ended up doing this the heat treating mm -hmm. of the steel and, and machining it cheaper than doing it forged. Mm -hmm. huh. You know, we could ask our friends at Ward's why it's such a significant engine. They named it one of the 10 best, most important engines of the 20th century, I mean, okay. which about, means of automotive history, yeah. essentially. Think about this. Uh, um, when it first came out in 32, it had 65 horsepower. They made a couple changes in 33. They got it up to 75. By 34, it had 85, which is about where it would stay. So conceivably, when one of those early V8 Fords came out, you, you might be driving a Model A with half the horsepower. You might still be driving a Model T, even, at that point. And to have a car that would do 75 miles an hour or more, yep. that's a revelation, right? Mm -hmm. A car that's reliable, fast, smooth, quiet. People fell in love with the V8. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, what's always impressed me too is uh, people like you and others mm -hmm. keep figuring out ways yeah. of improving the engine. In fact, we should talk about uh, Zora Arkas Duntoff, mm -hmm. father of the Corvette, yeah. actually designed heads for the flathead. Yeah. They call them Arden heads. Arden I guess heads. With a portmanteau of his name, Arkas yeah. Duntoff, Arden. And they were like hemi heads, and they're, they're massive. You see them on an engine, they're like. <laughs> <laughs> but they, he figured a way of blocking off the intake and exhaust ports and running overhead valves and getting a lot more power out of it. Brilliant it's an, engineering. It's an interesting example of how people show up in different com uh, uh, companies throughout automotive history. Think of the Dodge Brothers and Henry Ford and mm -hmm. Henry Leland, people like that. Well, here you've got Zora Arcus Duntoff and his brother Yara uh, building this, this, head, this uh, conversion for the Flathead Ford and then later found, uh, creates the Corvette for General Motors. So, okay, Let's, Steve, to, to your point earlier about you know, celebrating this because of the hot, hot rod history. Hot rodding history. Did the hot rodders glom onto that engine because it was widely available, or was there some characteristic of the way the architecture well, exists it, made it more amenable I to them? I think it was compact enough to fit where they wanted it to fit, and it and it you know you could do a lot with it. But the other element there is that uh, when all these guys wanted to use the flathead, then companies started developing aftermarket alterations for it, the heads, mm -hmm. uh, uh, blowers, all kinds of stuff were developed. You know, aftermarket accessories were developed for that engine. So, you know, its popularity sort of fed on itself. Because it was so popular, people would build all these aftermarket things for it. And then, so that made it even more, more desirable, I it think. It was the hot thing of the time, too. The day, there was right. no LS swap. Right, yeah. in the early fifties, you had and, one of these, and then of course, when Ford and Chevrolet made their small block V8s, overhead valve V8s, then interest in these waned a bit. Mm -hmm. But now, because of nostalgia, I suppose yeah. everybody's going back to them. In fact, my my brother is a hot rodder in Florida, and his daily driver is a thirty-two Ford pickup with a flathead, mm -hmm. uh, forty-eight flathead Mercury. And his son, who's an engineer for GM, has two of them. He's got a thirty-two sedan and, GM and a thirty-two Roadster, huh. and huh. he's with that. Technology. So here you've got two guys in modern times. One of them, a youngster, just love that flathead V8. It's others have said too the exhaust note that they really like. Is that true? Oh, mm -hmm. it's the very this sort of the shuffling, like syncopated. I don't know if that's the right word, but mm -hmm. this sort of rhythm to them because of the way the exhaust ports are arranged. They go into the block, which kind of muffles it a little bit. Yeah. Low compression too. You're not making a lot of power to begin with. But then on each bank, the center two cylinders, are, they share a common exhaust port. Hmm. 
So those are, there's sort of a, it just gives it this yeah. interesting character that you don't hear in any other engine. Right. It you definitely could, sounds like a V8, but something different. Yeah. When I was a kid, you could always tell the difference between a Ford and any other car driving down the road because of that distinctive sound. Mm -hmm. It was sort of of a, the flathead. You of the, well, the flat. I assume it was the flathead because uh -huh. it was always Fords that sounded that way, or sort of a yin 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 sort of sound. <laughs> is, that, is that how your engine sounds? I would describe yeah, it as yin yin. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> but they're very distinctive. I can tell you that. Yeah. Okay, we got some more uh, uh, people writing in. Kit Ger Gerhardt says. Affordable performance in 1932. That's why we celebrate the Ford Flathead. Amen. Yeah. Uh, yes. Rear wheel drive, please, says Ford Flathead footstool. <laughs> I think well, he's looking at it. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, that would make a cool right, table, right? man. Uh, you I, want to yeah, leave I've it seen, here, we'll put a glass <laughs> top on it. Yep, I've seen coffee tables like that. They're great. And he also writes in to say 50% rejection rate is pretty good considering it was the 30s mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. complexity. Yeah. And right. then he also adds, Henry was against anything that wasn't the Model T. <laughs> that's, that, that's that was true, true for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like they had to beg him to introduce the Model A, right? <laughs> so you brought a bunch of components. Yes, so, you know, what's notable about some of these things? All right, well. You got pistons and. So this is a piston. This would have been out of one of the latter series engines, probably 52 or 53. But it's, it's basically the same for all years. Um, you can see the rings are quite thick. And this engine was run to death. The ring lands are blown out. Uh. <laughs> this has worked really hard. Um, but it also has four rings. They added a secondary ring. At, at the, the very bottom. bottom of the piston, you see yeah. another ring. That, that was what, for reducing oil consumption? Or? They, they did have oil consumption issues, which we can get to with the valve guide here in a minute. Um, but yeah, they were trying to. It also, they thought it stabilized the piston in the bore. Honestly, if people are rebuilding an engine today, today, you just leave the fourth ring off. You don't need it. It's just an extra piece. It's extra mass. It's extra cost. Forget it. It does nothing. Finally, it's okay yeah. to put an engine together yeah. and have pieces left over. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and and is, is the mass really an issue? Gary, you're making 85 horsepower, yeah. all right? <laughs> Which, I mean, you could relatively easily double the output, too, with... The hot heads, mm. cool intake. all the accessories. Yeah, Show exactly. the valves, because that's really yeah. interesting. You have an integrated spring on it. Yeah, so the idea with these valves, the idea was that it was an entire unit. There would be a keeper on the bottom. I have it off right now because it's, I can't compress the spring enough by hand to get it off to show you guys. But the idea was that you would drop these assemblies right into the block, and then you would take a long lever with like a fork on the end. You'd pull the guide down just a little bit, and that would put tension on the spring. You drop what's called a horseshoe clip in, and that would hold the whole assembly in the block. Then, hmm. and this is that's an, hard, that's pretty clever. Actually. It is. So it's very, in theory, easy yeah. to service. But a lot of times the valve guides will get stuck in there with rust, or you know the oil they had back in the day was not very good, hmm. so it would it would gum up everything. Hmm. But um, this is an early valve, and if you notice, it's got a mushroom tip on the end. They thought it would uh, make it quieter when it was running against the lifter. Dubious claim, I think. Doesn't really <laughs> matter. But um, so, how do you have a valve guide with a mushroom tip then? How do you get the valve through the guide? It's a big question, right? Well, it's a very easy answer. You have a split guide. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Ah. See there. <laughs> but the idea was this would for quieter running. Ultimately, they phased it out and just went with a straight, you know, typical. The way we do it today, exactly, pretty much. Exactly. And a solid guide. But it's interesting because these tend to, on the intake at least, suck some oil past there, which is where some of the oil consumption does come from. Hmm. But interesting, it also had solid lifters. So in the early days, what you would do, you would lap your valves and everything, have the valve seats cut, lap them. And when you drop the valve assemblies in, they'd all be at different heights. And you need a prescribed you know, clearance between the lifter and the valve. So you'd have to either weld material on the end of the valve to close it up, or machine it down uh, to get the, the what lap set a correctly. hassle. But the, the, the idea is, and the good thing is, once you do that, it's pretty much set for life okay. until the next rebuild. Yeah, but I'm but, talking at the manufacturing yes. plant. That means you so need they had stacks of yeah. valves and, yeah. and lifters. And they would probably select, sort them, and then they'd yeah, have right. exactly the size, drop it in, and go. Uh -huh. So the early lifters were solid. This happens to be a later one, but it's, you get the idea. It's a solid mm. lifter. Yeah. The aftermarket, brilliant. An adjustable lifter. It's got a nut on there. So you put your feeler gauge in, you adjust it to 14 thousandths or whatever it is. Done. Walk away. No grinding, no welding. Easy. <laughs> and it seems to have the same mushroom design. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Let's see the, the ignition that oh, you've yeah, got this there. Oh, yeah. This is, this is a, a distributor. Cool 
It's called a crab style. This would have been from about 1942. It's the style that I run on my car because it's the easiest uh, to deal with. You can see the cap goes on just like that. And that's a wild see. looking distributor cap. Yeah, that's why they call it the crab. Oh, the yeah, it looks like yep, a crab. Yep. It. Yep. So each plug lead runs out of there, runs to the appropriate cylinder. But it's very clever. It's got dual points inside. One half of the points controls when the spark plugs fire, as you would expect in a typical modern distributor. But the other one also opens up a little bit after the, um, the spark plug fires, which gives the coil a little bit more time to saturate. So it's got more Explain it more, because I don't, I don't fully understand. So the one side fires the plug, but immediately, immediately after that fires, the other set of points opens, which basically it's just giving the coil more time to juice To up, recharge. Basically, exactly, which is a very clever <clears> idea. <throat> That they, I mean, you could do it easily with just one set of points, but they added two just to go the extra mile. They were very reliable, smooth-running engines that worked well for many years. And this distributor, I was telling you earlier, John, it's got centrifugal advance for the timing, but it also has a vacuum brake. So there's a piston in here with a spring, and under light loads, you're going to have higher engine vacuum, right? So that vacuum is going to keep that piston sucked up. Mm -hmm. against the tension of the spring. But as you get on the throttle, engine vacuum <clears throat> drops. So the spring overcomes that, and it will actually push that piston down against part of the advance mechanism. It will retard the timing. So if you've got bad gas or something, or you live in a mountainous area, you're right. climbing a hill, it's hot it. out, you can mm -hmm. adjust this screw on the top, which yeah. changes the tension on the spring and prevents spark knock. Who needs electronic engine control? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. So what's with the connecting rod? Connecting rod, I just, it's. I just brought it in because it's kind of frail looking, but it should be, it's pretty light. It's, um, they're very strong though. They are forgings, I believe manganese steel forgings. Mm. So the hot rodders would use these really without issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get like Eagle or scat rods today with H-beam design, I-beam yeah. design, um, yeah. if you want to go crazy. But in an engine with three main bearings, is that all? That's all. For a V8. Yeah, that's all you need, really. <laughs> but yeah. With 85 horsepower, see, yeah. yeah, sure. So, so why did he just go with three? Less friction. He was, it's a fuel economy play. Interesting. Yeah. No, Even in those just, days. So in, just cheap. They in, didn't. in spite of the <laughs> flathead's uh, limitations and uh, heat dissipation uh -huh. and breathing and so forth, it must have been a pretty dependable engine oh, to have lasted dependable. that long. Yeah. So, you know, if you, weren't, if you weren't driving it too hard, yeah. it, was, it would last and, and be very easily repairable. So in yeah. other words, if you didn't crack the block, you'd be all yes. set. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And huh. really, the overheating isn't so much an issue these days. If you get the sand and the scale and the rust out of the block, mm -hmm. you're well ahead. Um, also, if you run coolant, so it doesn't, you know, antifreeze, so it doesn't rust further, uh -huh. you're ahead. You can get a pressurized radiator. You get these things, you really don't have to worry. Hmm. Amado Arceo from mm. Saginaw writes in to point out, and I'm sure you know this story, John Dillinger said his favorite car was a Ford because it had the flathead V8 that could outrun the police yeah. with their inline six-cylinder Chevys, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Or, or like uh, Dodge and Plymouth had a flathead straight six, bulletproof, but very lethargic from what I've read. I haven't mm -hmm. actually driven one. I haven't either, but, but. but yeah, that's, that's the case. And here Henry Ford developed this engine to compete with Chevrolet, who had beaten his pants the year before. Yes. So now... It just took a year or two, and that uh, that started out selling Chevrolet. Yeah. So it, it was a success in that in that respect. We're getting out forward to the end of this, but we got to yeah. squeeze this in. Andy G writes in from the Philippines. Wants oh, to wow. know: Does anyone build new flathead V8s like there are new 302 and 351 crate engines? Not yet. There, I see online there's a guy that's working on doing that, but yep. he's still he's like some CNC engineer or something. Yeah. I don't know. And there, there was a guy out at the Points and Condenser Preservation Society a few years ago from I believe he was from Troy that's working on that very thing, and he had a one-off sort of example of it. It was yeah. really magnificent. And last question here, Everett Mish says, was uh, it Henry that pushed the flathead versus overhead valve to keep it simple? Uh, it was all simplicity, I would say. They were familiar with flathead from the Model T, from the Model A, and it was easy enough for them to sort of put two inline fours together. That's not exactly what it is. There are a lot of differences, but in theory, that's what it is, mm -hmm. basically. And they were, I mean, and at the time, the gasoline was of low octane, right? Very low quality. Right. So would an engine even be able to really take advantage 
What's the I compression mean, ratio? I was anywhere from half. five to oh. well, seven to one. Well, there's your answer right I mean, there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the gasoline <laughs> was of low quality. Yeah. And like Chevrolet had the inline six with overhead valves. I would argue that was sort of a paper tiger because you can't, the engine can't really rev. It did not have full pressure lubrication. It had these sort of oil jets that would spray at these dippers on the connecting rods. It's just <laughs> crazy. At least this had full pressure lubrication. Uh. Real good. Well, look, we're going to have to take a, a quick break right now. Uh, Steve, you're going to be leaving us momentarily, but we're going to get you back after a, a, a second break. Uh, we're going to have uh, Sean McElroy come in and talk about some stuff that he saw at Honda. But first, a shout out to our friends at Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Okay, we're all back here talking about things on Autoline After Hours. Now Sean's joining us. Good to have you on board. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So you went, was it this week or last week, to some event Honda had? It was the week before. And uh, they're calling it their smart intersection? Exactly right, yeah. What's it about? Well, they're just trying to take connected vehicles and be able to warn them of things that they wouldn't be able to normally see. Uh, they took an intersection in Marysville, Ohio, not far from their factory there. And uh, it was a somewhat unique corner that there's buildings on all four corners. So uh, being able to see around the corner would be difficult, or they were also showing how the system could detect emergency vehicles or a vehicle that might run a, run a red light. And uh, the way they were doing that is uh, on the top of the, the lights, the traffic lights, they had cameras up there. There were cameras on each four corners. And uh, those cameras would shoot down and they would survey the area, try and see what was there, if there was a pedestrian that might be walking across the street or whatever. And it would, the camera would take that and they'd send it down into a computer. Now the computer in this case was a big black box that they had set up on the corner of the intersection. And the computer then would take what it's getting from the camera and the computer would determine is it a person? Is it a vehicle? Is it an emergency vehicle? And then they could determine from there and then send that back up to a radio that was also on top of the traffic light. And then that information would be sent down to the connected vehicle and that would be displayed on the head up display uh, for the driver to see. And it would say, uh, warning, uh, keep your eye out for pedestrians or whatever it was gonna say. And then the driver could take action from there. Did it work? Yeah, it worked really well. Uh, they put us in three scenarios. The, the What I was talking about, pedestrian, emergency vehicle, and a vehicle running a red light. And uh, even before we came up to the corner, we were making a right-hand turn for the pedestrian, and the pedestrian would come across the street. And uh, it would say, hey, keep an eye out before you could even see that person. And the same with the car running the red light or the emergency vehicle. Before you could ever see it in the inside the car, it was coming up with, the, with that. So did Honda make an argument as to why that might be a better approach than having cars in emergency vehicles talk to cars? Rather than using the infrastructure, hmm. having each individual, you know, so, so V to V rather than V to X. Yeah, I mean, in V to V, you're not going to take into consideration pedestrians. And I also kind of look at it like this. Uh, they always talk about, in the airline industry, redundancy of systems. You know, if something fails, or a sensor could be dirty, or, you know, the communication to the vehicle might be down, between vehicles might be down, or something like that. I just look at it as another data point for the car to have mm -hmm. for something to, you know, if something's going to mm -hmm. go wrong, why not have as much data as you possibly can have? Right. Because I, I was out at Continental Automotive, as Seamus was, another McElroy. Um, Too many McElroy. And, <laughs> and, and, and we, we did a we did a, a V to V demonstration, and it's, it's it's remarkable how simple the system really is. I mean, basically, all they need is an ECU, an antenna, and a radio, 
And, you know, it was, we, we did a demonstration where there was a car hidden behind a curve and how the warning came up because, you know, the car was, was stalled right on the curve. And it's just like, you couldn't see it visually and bang, you knew ahead of time. How did it, did it warn you? Or? Yeah, a warning right on the uh, okay. uh, cluster and, and audibly, you know, beep, 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 beep. Yeah. Hmm. What about tying in the brakes or anything like that? They said that would be the another step. step. Yeah, that it was it was technically feasible, not a, not a problem whatsoever. Okay. Because because the other thing was like um, how emergency braking is going to become, you know, uh, they said it's not going to be a requirement, but by 2022, 20 major automakers have committed to putting it on cars across the board, mm -hmm. and so you think automated about emergency braking, correct? Is, right. And so you think about something like that and tie that into, you know, information, whether it's, you know, on a uh, street light or a traffic signal and, and put it in the car. Yeah, the other thing that V2V might not catch uh, is, you know, another vehicle may not, if someone's walking across the street, let's say, and there's another vehicle around, maybe it's already gone past that person. So you're the first one coming up to it. Right. So you might be able to, you know, warn another vehicle behind you at that point, mm -hmm. which uh, would also be another reason why sure. they were doing that test. Mm -hmm. How are, how are all, all of these things communicating? Is it Wi-Fi, Bluetooth? Is it using cellular service? How does it actually talk? They were using a cellular service. They were using okay. uh, DSRC, dedicated short-range communication. Okay. And they talked about, you know, possibly 5G as well coming up. Mm -hmm. But they were uh, saying that that's what's available now. It's been tested, you know, military to military standards. So that's what they had. If 5G comes along and proves it's better, they could always switch over to that as well, but they just wanted to test yeah. the system now. So, so did they say, I mean, is, is this fundamentally going to be the responsibility of municipalities to put this stuff in, or would car makers do, I mean, I think that's still part of the test mm. that, they, you know, and there, you know, from there, you've got to come up with uh, some sort of regulation. How do you regulate the, the systems and all that, too? But yeah, my, 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 I've been a big proponent of DSRC. I don't think it's going to survive mm. uh, for the very reason that you raise, Gary. It is pretty much municipalities, counties, states that have got to put in all this infrastructure None of them have the money to do it. This is after they put the charging stations in, by right. the way. We gotta, and so uh, the telcos, the telephone companies, have all been pushing for 5G. However, I just learned last weekend that at CES, there's going to be a major announcement of using 4G, but it's like some special aspect of 4G <laughs> that... Half G. <laughs> Four and a half G, there you go. <laughs> or 4.27. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> right. Four it's the flathead version. There you go. But It's 1G. But it, the infrastructure is already out there. All you'd have to do is incorporate it into cars as well. And, uh, and even if it ultimately goes to 5G, the telcos are going to make all this investment. And so, and uh, besides the, uh, the internet providers hmm. all want that bandwidth but that DSRC takes. What, what do the telcos want in exchange for doing all well, that? Want your the, data or what? No, like, well, not necessarily. It... Everything's got to be routed through their stuff. Uh. So, yeah, they're going to, you know, hmm. slice, off, slice off fractions of a penny, but it all adds up. DSRC is beautiful in that, you know, it's free, mm -hmm. essentially. Once the municipalities, who, hmm. whoever puts in, you know, wires all the intersections, uh, and that's that's been one of the objections to to going to 5G is oh my God you know now the telcos get all the money mm -hmm. but it's also interesting and we've reported this on AutoLine Daily Qualcomm has come up with a chipset that handles both both DSRC and 5G so they're sort of hedging their bets whichever way it goes the beauty of the system is though this could have a dramatic improvement in sa safety car to car car to pedestrian whatever. But what was Honda's big argument? I mean, what, why were they saying that they thought this was a, a way to go? In just uh, f for the test itself? Or yeah, I, mean, just... I mean, why are they doing it? I mean, is, is it a safety play or is it? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely a safety play. Plus, there's still, it, I mean, obviously it's still in its infancy. So mm -hmm. they want, there's still a whole lot more to learn. They talked about, uh, you know, weather conditions as well. And that's one thing that I wonder too, is like, how is everything? I mean, obviously the communication doesn't care about weather, but 
cameras definitely care about weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's still just a whole lot more that they can learn from it. And they also brought up the, the aspect of regulation, you know, where, you know, who's going to be at fault if something happens and, uh, you know, how do you regulate the, the system itself. So there's still a whole lot more to learn. And I think that's, that's part of it as well. But safety is definitely the big play. So, so, so this was in downtown Marysville. Downtown Mar Marysville, yeah. Okay, and, and you guys got a demo. I mean, is, is it there? So you did the demo last week or the week before, it doesn't matter. Is it, is it there right now? Yeah. Yep. And, and, and it had are, been there for several months as well. And, and are there just special cars that Honda has engineered that can make? Yeah, they it? said that there are Honda cars and there's also other vehicles within this fleet of vehicles that they will have. And I think it's going to be up to 200 uh, or so that are connected, mm -hmm. connected cars that can go through the intersection and get these warnings. See, so it'd be interesting. So, so Cadillac offers V to V right now. And so, which, which would make the argument that basically since only Cadillac offers V to V, that only Cadillacs can talk to Cadillacs, right? Correct. But the question is, if you have V to V on your car, does it also talk to the infrastructure? So maybe if a Cadillac goes rolling through Marysville, I could get the information. It would just catch on fire. It's I don't Honda think. Town. Thinks, <laughs> I don't it, think it would have to have the exact same protocols, which it may well have uh, of what Honda put up there. But I got to tell you, I, I General Motors gave me a V to V demonstration that knocked my socks off. I want to say in 2004 uh, at a proving grounds, mm. they thought it would be in production by 2012. But then this thing happened called the Great Recession, <laughs> and, and, and GM went bankrupt. Uh, but that's the, one of the reasons why Cadillac's got the system. But it's a DSRC system. Much of Ann Arbor is already wired for this kind of communication. Uh, and I want to say uh, they've done it through the OBD2 port. And it may not be as grandiose as what... Uh, Honda showed you in Marysville, but there's a lot of intersections and I want to say as many as 10,000 cars that have signed up for the service in Ann so Arbor. you just plug a little module into the port and, Correct. and it works? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it will not do automated emergency braking, but it will give you warnings that mm -hmm. somebody that you can't see is coming around to Ben is running the red light or whatever. And the people who have signed up for it are like gaga over the whole thing. They really like it. Like I said, I, I think it could be a massive safety breakthrough. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as you're not getting a warning at every intersection that you're yeah. crossing through, like, ah, yeah, right. you'll be okay. Yeah. Well, cool, Sean. Thanks for that report. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's it. technologically interesting enough that we had to do something about it on the show. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things, like I said, you need a lot of data points for all these cars to be coming along. And I think it's a, definitely a good thing that they're doing these tests now. Yeah, for sure. So the last time we had you, you were talking about the Hellcat, right? That was the demon. The demon, all right. Demon, yeah. So, so quite the... what was more interesting, the uh, Vita I or? Well, interesting, demon. I would say the uh, Honda uh, test, but if you're talking excitement, mm -hmm. okay, definitely the demon. All right, just, yeah, just <laughs> checking. I wanted to calibrate. Yeah, you passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take another quick break here, give a shout out to our friends at Lear and Bridgestone. We're going to bring Steve Birdie back on the set. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back. And uh, Carmen just told me we got a, a phone call from Clem. Let's bring it in. Uh, this is Clem Zorowski in Delmont, Pennsylvania. My first car was a 41 Ford with a 59 AB block, two Stromberg 97 carburetors, Sandy B lawn headers, and in each tailpipe, I had a spark plug po powered by a Model T vibrator coil, <laughs> so you could uh, go down the road, shut off the ignition, push the button, and it had flamethrowers out of each tail dual exhaust. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for that, Clem. That's awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Have you seen the flamethrower? I've thing? seen flamethrower kits before. Basically, you'll, it mounts a spark plug in the tailpipe, 
and you can kill the ignition, which stops the engine from burning fuel, which ends up getting pushed down the exhaust stream, and then that back spark plug will ignite it, and you'll shoot flames. I'll bet that does wonders for your muffler. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> who needs a muffler? Yeah. My car, actually, I took them off. And, Did you really? Yeah, it's straight pipes. Oh, Is really? it loud? It's loud, but it's not unbearable because, again, the engine doesn't make that much power, really, mm -hmm. and the block kind of... Do your neighbors agree with you that it's not that loud? <laughs> Screw <laughs> right. no, it, it, In truth, it's, it's not unbearable. It is a little loud, but not as loud as, like, a muscle car would be if you were running yeah. straight pipes. I wonder you go about this flamethrower thing. Could it go the wrong way and blow up your car? I guess if you had the timing way off, it could backfire through so the carburetor. Didn't, didn't screw that <laughs> down. No, not if you follow the Ford specs, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's the time of the show where we got to have Dr. Data. Okay, so because I knew that we were going to have a vintage oriented vehicle. You're talking about I, Craig? He's not that <laughs> Vintage oriented yeah. person. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's his soul. <laughs> so, anyway, so. I, I was I was looking at some information from CarMax, which largely sells used cars by and large. I mean, okay. apparently you can buy some new cars from them. But so this is going to be a choice of what people who are looking for these cars want in the car. So, Katie, could you bring the first up? Okay. So the most desirable feature in a vehicle sold by CarMax is it a navigation system, a rear view camera, Bluetooth, leather seats? or a front seat heater. Ooh, wow. I don't see flathead engine. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> what a CarMax I, I, know. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's actually, that's actually oh. below the uh, list yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. They just didn't have room on the screen. Number 476 on the yeah. list of... I know what I would pick out of all that, but Craig, yeah. take a shot. Boy. What do you think? I'm going to guess probably navigation because I don't know how many people I see driving a Mercedes-Benz or a similar car that have their phone up to the side of their face rah, 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 when they're driving. Your car has standard Bluetooth. Just yeah. hook it up. It's not that hard. So I'm going to say navigation. What do you think? Well, uh, I'm probably not front seat here. I wish I had some demographics on who these people are on the car buyer, but, you know, navigation is important. You know, if they're mostly youngsters, probably Bluetooth. Oh, man, it, to me, it's easy. I want a seat heater. But you're in Michigan. What about, uh, you know, southern climates? Yeah, they well, guess what? That. When it gets well, down to 68 degrees in southern night. California, oh, they want their true. seat heaters. Yeah, you might be right on that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually surprised at the responses in some ways. Hmm. Why? What are you going to pick, Gary? Well, he I, I know the answer. answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's going to pick the right See what he picks. So, so we do have a winner. Oh. So... Who do we think the winner might be? Well, I think I'm the winner. Of I'm course. going to be modest and stay, stay Steve. And you would be correct. So. Oh, really? Really? Bluetooth. 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 So, so, so we'll look at the numbers. So show us what the numbers are here. So look at that. I mean, wow. it's, it's significant. Wow. I was last. You were dead wow. last. Is there a difference between last and dead last? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if, the, if the demographics of these buyers were like me, uh. that wouldn't be Bluetooth. But I'm guessing that most of the car buyers at... Uh, uh, and the source are but what, was the, what was the question again? Go, can you put that back? The most desirable feature in a, in a vehicle sold by CarMax. Because I would think most people don't, from what I see, don't even know what Bluetooth is. They're just driving around <laughs> with the phone <laughs> next to their face. That's so, right. I am well, surprised. Well, obviously, they didn't buy their car correctly from CarMax. Mm. Or from the but, but I mean, I, I mean, but, but, but that Delta, I mean, I, I, I would have thought leather seats. Mm. Yeah, why would, why would I think leather seats? Because if, if you're buying an, an older car, right, and you got leather seats, it's sort of like bragging rights. You know, yeah. I got leather. You know. yeah. Or you can get cat skin leather. That would be important could, to me. Yeah. They could but redo you, your yeah. car, but I'm just saying that. Would, uh, but my experience is the navigation systems in cars today are all inferior to what I have on my cell phone. Absolutely true. So, way inferior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I don't care if I have navigation or not, although it's important for me to have traffic information. Well, your I'm phone will give you that. that. Yeah, it, right. It'll do just as well. Google Earth or uh, Waze, they, mm -hmm. they got all that. Uh, okay, Gary, wh what do you think we should be talking about news-wise? What's really caught your attention? Well, I thought what was sort of interesting is, is that Uber, the ride-hailing service, um, may go for an IPO. It's being valued by one at at 120 billion dollars wow which basically would be worth more than ford gm and fca combined does that make wow. sense does yeah. that make sense that's my question to you craig no oh, it doesn't make sense to me but the car companies actually make a real a tangible product that they're selling there's a lot of they employ a lot of people there are suppliers involved mm. i mean uber they're just 
I mean, it's, I'm not downplaying the significance of ride sharing, but I think they're separate. That shouldn't be that much. Okay, but, 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 but doesn't this sort of maybe go indicate that going forward, that things like this ride hailing app will become more valuable as people and buy fewer yes. vehicles from Ford, FCA, and General Motors and everybody else in the world? And that's also a recognition that Uber is leading the pack and is likely to be the number one uh, provider as this market uh, matures. Mm -hmm. Because Lyft is going to is going to go for an IPO, and they're looking at fifteen point one billion dollars, which is oh, just okay. nothing. You know, I mean, it's just right. rounding error. Well, Uber's the, around the world. I don't think uh, Lyft right. is. Right. But even so, you know, to your point, Gary, companies like General Motors and Ford make billions of dollars in mm. profit. <laughs> Uber loses billions yeah. of dollars, <laughs> yeah, right. and yet it's valued at way more than any of them. That mm. that's the mind blowing yeah. thing. Do in you my guys case. think it's just people wanting to be involved in the next big thing? That investors just oh, new technology, yeah, let's go. It's got to be great, woo, and and just not thinking not it through. Attention. There or, is like, that. I mean, there is that. No question about it. Uh, but I think, you know, everybody's hoping, oh, I'm buying the next Apple. Mm -hmm. I'm buying the next mm -hmm. Google. I'm getting in at the ground yeah. floor, and it's going to shoot oh. to the moon. Over $100 billion doesn't sound like the ground floor to me. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> you think about it another way. I mean, you know, the word Uber has come into the language sort of like Kleenex now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I'm going to mm -hmm. take an Uber. Genericized trade. Right? I mean, and so, so it, it isn't like it's something... That is mysterious and new and cool and coming. It's just like, eh, you know, you got the app on your phone. Call. There you go. <laughs> Good point. The other, the other thing that caught my eye was uh, so. Gosh, I guess it was it was last winter we um, had Simon Spruill on the show from yeah. uh, Aston, Aston Martin. And uh, so while we're in this financial uh, discussion, so um, Aston. Did went, an IPO. Did an IPO, and they thought that they were going to be making money hand over fist, and apparently a lot of uh, short sellers are uh, in the process of saying, mm, we're not so so thrilled about what you guys are up to, and we would like to make some money. And uh, so I, I guess my question is, so let's see. Um, blah, 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 um, Shares have plummeted more than 20% since they started trading on October 2nd, and so they started out uh, valued at 5.7 billion. Again, hmm. not very much money compared to Uber. But so, I mean, what do you what do you make of this, John? I mean, so here's Aston Martin, a legendary, vaunted British motor car manufacturer. But niche, very niche. Very niche, but presumably very, very mm -hmm. capable and profitable mm -hmm. in what it's doing. Um, being toyed with by investors rather than by <laughs> car enthusiasts. Well, look, Aston wanted to do the IPO because it can't get enough money. It's got to do all this electrification stuff, too. Mm -hmm. That's going to cost a bundle. So it went to the stock market to try to raise a whole bunch of money, got, I don't know, a nice chunk of change. But with uh, some savvy investors were going, hmm, this is a very niche company. Mm -hmm. It has to spend a fortune to electrify, and by the way, all this thing called autonomy is coming around, so if they want to play in that, they're going to have to invest right. in that, or maybe autonomy is going to wipe out people's desire for uh. sports cars, and on top of that, there's this thing called Brexit that could destroy all British industry. <laughs> so why not short the stock, and from what you're saying, looks like they've made some tidy profits. Mm -hmm. But but would their electrification cost them that much? They are partnered with Daimler, couldn't they get some of their... Sure, but you know, Daimler's not going to give it to well, them. They, They're going to have to cut them a sweet from deal, them. right? Well, I don't, I, I don't think it'll be sweet. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, sure, you can go out on the market and, and buy stuff, but you still have got to integrate it into your cars. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a bunch of piston head people. Mm -hmm. You've got a bunch of people who know how to build flathead mm -hmm. V8s. Do they know anything about electrons? Maybe not. So now you got to go out and hire a bunch of electrical engineers yeah. that know this stuff. Yeah. yeah, and there may be other partnerships out there, but like John says, I mean, they're, they're, you're going to have to pay for all of that, either in dilution of your uniqueness, basically, with Aston Martin or a company like that, or in any other way. So, But they do have the Lagonda brand, right? I think it was at the Geneva show they, they had some sort of, I forget the name of it, it was like a pod car. It was all electric. It was beautiful. Uh -huh. So maybe they could fork and have Lagonda do the one thing and Aston Martin can well, stick look, with... Uh, you know, Andy Palmer, who used to be big muckety-muck, reported uh, at Nissan, reported directly to Carlos Ghosn. He's now running Aston mm -hmm. Martin. Mm -hmm. I think what he's been doing there is terrific. 
And Simon, one of our favorite guys in the industry, is, is working there as their head of communications and marketing. Mm -hmm. I think what Aston has achieved for being such a little company it's a, it's remarkable. Is, is really good. They've driven a lot of their products. And a few years ago, they were forgettable. But now, they're legitimately nice. They're yeah. like, the DB11 is excellent. You get the Super Legera. It's fast. It sounds amazing. And the company has such an amazing heritage. Yes. That's what I appreciate. I appreciate that heritage. Yeah. And they're beautiful cars. Beautiful. Oh, they, absolutely. They just stop yeah. traffic. I mean, yeah. if you see a Ferrari go by, it's cool, whatever, but who, I'd who rather an Aston. design it, Aston? Um, Mark Reichman. Oh, I don't yes. know him. Yes. Uh, he once upon a time worked at Ford. Yeah. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Ford's still copying him, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, there was that, that grill thing, right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, found, I found this interesting quote from uh, Klaus Froelich, since we have a, a powertrain expert here on the, on the show, um, who is a, a BMW board member for development, and, and he told this uh, Go Auto, which apparently is this Australian uh, um, publication or website, quote, we have a spiral in Europe where every politician sees only one solution, diesel bas bashing. Mm. And he says, quote, from... A CO2 and customer perspective, a modern diesel is a very good solution, especially for heavy, high-performing cars. So basically saying, damn it, this diesel stuff is still good. I well, I'm, I've always been a diesel fan, you know, from the old days of the Mercedes four-cylinder diesel and my brother's uh, sedan, a little sedan. But, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm not an engineer. But to me, there is a lot of advantages to a diesel still. The, particularly with modern technology for cleaning up the exhaust, you know, the Mercedes Bluetooth or whatever, not Bluetooth, Blue, uh, Tech. Blue, yeah. Blue Tech, yeah. Blue Tech, Ad Blue Diesel. Yeah. 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 So, you know, uh, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm still high on diesel. Craig, you probably diesels have one great. that you built in your garage. <laughs> that, uh, well, yeah. I, I, I like diesels. They're very nice. Um, for, for you know, torque, fuel economy, et cetera. I would still take a good gasoline engine over a great diesel, personally. But I see where diesels, why people like diesels. But what about a good an electric motor over a diesel engine? I would probably, I mean, maybe, because like you, you said you were driving the Tesla Model X. X. Yeah. And I've driven electrics. I was just in the, um, the Kona electric, for instance, Hyundai Kona. Electric is fantastic. On, on paper, electric is the best solution because it has practically no moving parts. You get instant torque. As long as you can have a battery with enough capacity, right, and you can charge it reasonably quickly, there's nothing there to break, really. It's all one unit, basically. So I like electrics, but I understand they don't work for a lot of people. Well, it and I might take an electric over a diesel. It seems to me that the, the diesel and the electric are a great combination. Look at the locomotive. Mm -hmm. You've got a big diesel engine generating electricity. Well, with an automobile, you could have this little tiny diesel running at a constant RPM, most efficient thing you could possibly have running a generator mm -hmm. for your electric car. But then again, as with most of these cases, you've got two separate powertrains to pay for. So the cost Money. goes up. But you know, as far as efficiency is concerned, I would think that would be a charming powertrain. I think diesels are salesproof. Uh, well, not in tr uh, pickup trucks no, in the U.S. Not, market. But I mean, for, for, for everything for else. For, for everybody. Passenger yeah. vehicles. For passenger, passenger vehicles, vehicles. I, I, I would totally agree with you, Gary. I, well, I, I love them. I think they're great to drive. Uh, they're very expensive mm -hmm. yeah. to clean up. You know, as Bob Lutz used to always say, you have to build this little chemical factory <laughs> under the car yeah. to get the exhaust clean. And, and uh, yeah, look, the writing's on the wall. Europe was the, mm -hmm. the primary market for passenger car diesels, and they are turning against it. And diesel but will are, probably never transcend the scandals of mm -hmm. Volkswagen and yeah. Audi right. and right. so forth. Are diesels as dirty if they're running on biodiesel no. as they are petroleum? No. Biodiesel cleans it up. Okay, so you... Uh, yeah, if so they could just un figure that out, then. Yeah. So if Willie Nelson didn't turn to weed, he could <laughs> yeah. just con Maybe. continue with his bio yeah, Willie. Right. Right. Yeah. That, uh... <laughs> hey, we're, we're getting towards the end. We got a, a few more questions and comments. In fact, we got a phone call. Carmen, let's bring in that other phone call. Hey, John and the cast. Got a quick question here. Have anybody seen the change of style of Ford spelling, you know, from the uh, old English style to the black style on the sneak peeks? that they showed several months ago on uh, some of the upcoming vehicles, you know, what the traditional Ford spelling to the black style they had on those. Do you think that's coming? And one quick question on another thing. Can you guys give 
me your opinion of what, one or two things of what brought the downfall of the, four, of the uh, Chrysler Viper several years ago. Was it the price, the design, uh, marketing? Uh, thanks very much, and I hope I kept it under 30 seconds. Take care. <laughs> Good. Great state of Michigan forever. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks. And you, you, you got two good topics in there. I don't know. Has, so is it's, Ford it's, changing it's, the script? It's the it's the like the front end of the Raptor. Yeah. Mm. So they're using block letters. Okay. F O R D. Only on the Raptor. That is on the Raptor, the Raptor, and then yeah. then on the uh, here's the uh, Bronco. Yeah. That, well, that well, they've they're done hung. that for years. The bad tailgates of the old trucks used to have it spelled. Yeah, right. but, it, letters, right? but but this is interesting. So this is this is you know the yet what twenty twenty or. 22 for 87 who knows yeah. for, for, the, <laughs> them for so the Bronco long. the Bronco the, I think is 2020 2020 yeah, so, I, don't think they so do. I think I think what the point is is that is that basically they're they're making that move for trucks right mm. and then you put the blue oval on the back and right. you'll have that right. in the front I don't think they're going to change their logo this is just model specific graphics mm. and right yeah. and design so if you have yeah. a big ass grill you just put something like yeah. that on there mm -hmm. technical term yeah <laughs> and uh <laughs> and my take on the Viper all the items that he checked off were all correct i mean they all conspired to make mm -hmm. that thing yeah. uh, styling price everything and the other element to that car, wasn't it like it, well, the, la the recent version version is is more sophisticated right. than the original mm -hmm. the original you know <laughs> that was funny when we had lutz here because you know they had when the original viper came out they said ah, it doesn't have abs it doesn't have stability control it doesn't have any of that crap this is a driver well oh, now yeah. he's come clean yeah. they were trying to keep the cost down they didn't <laughs> want to put any of that in yeah, right. and, and the, another issue is uh, you know like the ssr there's only a limited audience for that right car. the demand just... again we'll use the term niche it's a niche vehicle and maybe the uh the the demand had been satiated I think you're right. Maybe, but I, I I think price had more to do with it than anything else because I want to say they they raised the price like twenty five thousand wow. uh, dollars. So from one model year to the next, twenty five grand. Yeah. That took out a lot of buyers. Maybe they right didn't there. charge enough because like the Ford GT has yeah, been yeah. sold out, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And they just had an event they announced today. They're upping production of that by about yeah. three hundred and fifty units. So of the GT, yeah. And what, so that's half a million dollars, right? So maybe they didn't price the Viper high enough yeah, to attract. Maybe. <laughs> so what, what are the prices like on used Vipers, I wonder? Uh, That'd be an interesting question. study yeah. to go see what you could buy a used That's Viper. a great point, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. That'll yeah. tell you the story yeah. as to demand. Right. Look, uh, we burned up an hour. I think we could keep going. <laughs> but uh, in uh, deference to our audience, <laughs> I think we ought to wrap this up. Craig Cole, thanks so much for coming on the show. Awesome to have up. you here with all these bits yeah. and pieces of block. Yeah. This is good <laughs> stuff. And it's old. It's rusty. You know, it's not rusty. like it's rusty. It's, it's, <laughs> th in fact, it looks like there's, you know, it looks like you got to polish that up, man. <laughs> well, Still stand in there, maybe. Yeah, there probably is. Right? <laughs> this has been, like I said, through the hot tank. So the, the grease and the bulk of the crap's been flushed out, but it needs mm. to be machined and cleaned again and yeah. gone through, inspected, which I haven't done yet. Cool. Well, you better get on it. I know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Steve Purdy, thanks so much for being here. Oh, my Real pleasure. Real pleasure to have yeah. you on the show. Well, thanks. And Gary, we'll just keep on doing this. Yes, yeah, do it next week. Okay, we'll do it next week, and we invite all of you to join us right. then. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. You know, as I'm looking at the, the bell housing mm -hmm. on the back of the block here, there's some numbers. Yeah. It looks like Q8411 or something like that. And C or G. This might be a Canadian block. A lot of times those are just hmm. casting numbers that mean nothing. They're just a serial number for the mold or something. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I, I, I thought so. usually if you saw markings like that, it told you the date. The shift, the time, oh, they the did, place where it was made? They did that 49 and up. They would stamp some numbers and letters <clears throat> on the intake surface here, which you huh. can cross-reference to the month and the year. Huh. Um, but oftentimes, engines were reconditioned, and they would mill those surfaces, so you, they'd cut the numbers <laughs> off, and you'd never, you wouldn't know. I mean, you'd know what 
series it was, roughly, yeah. but you wouldn't have an exact date. Now, the caller that called in, he said he had a 59, whatever, AB, I think it was, in his 41 Ford. Yeah. So the, the middle series engines, just like this one, a lot of them that were in passenger cars had 59 cast on the bell housing, so they're sort of the 59 series. Oh. I don't know what 59 corresponds <laughs> to, but that's what, that was the number they had on there. Ooh. Hey, we got another question here. Oh. The Seattle cyclist wants Ooh. to know, could the flathead engine become a relevant powertrain in cars? It's a good, I mean, uh, they still they still make it in lawnmowers and stuff. It's it's yeah. affordable, it's low cost, right? And I guess if you've got an engine that's just running at a steady state, maybe as an electrical generator or something, it might work. Yeah. But you've still got those breathing issues yes. just because of the yeah. design. I mean, today, so I can't imagine it'd be... You know, for passenger cars, which are so heavily measured from emissions, mm -hmm. I don't think you could make this yeah. work. Yeah. But I'm not, a, I, I'm not an engine engineer, I couldn't say. I th yeah. the, um, these actually burn quite cleanly because there's so much turbulence through the intake track. Because <laughs> uh. you think about it, the air and fuel has to come down through the carburetor, <laughs> through the manifold, down through here, come up 90 degrees, then down another 90 degrees. <laughs> There's so much, it's so well mixed, it burns quickly huh? and clean, relatively mm. cleanly. Interesting. With very little initial advance, at least compared to like a small block. Mm. What's this little pipe at the, the front at of the, the block? Front, this is where the, this is the breather. But that's it. not cast in, it's, is it? It's a steel tube they pressed in. And also there's a steel tube that runs through the center here for the oil hmm. gallery that feeds the mains, the main bearings. But this is a breather that goes down to the oil pan where there's an outlet. Uh -huh. And on the early engines like this one, they had a breather cap at the back and just vent oil mist down the back. <laughs> yeah. like the, the, Who the, cares? Yeah. The passenger side of the Fords would never rust because there's this constant stream of <laughs> oil mist <laughs> blowing down. It's a big block. Yeah. Yeah, well, think about it. All of the gas flow in and out is in this one piece. Imagine drawing up the cores and the patterns in the cores to make this. I can't, yeah. can't even imagine. And that's 80 years ago. Right. Because, I mean, there's... You What's know, the no. displacement? So initially, it was 3 and 1 16th bore by 3 and 3 quarter stroke, which gave you 221 cubic inches, mm -hmm. which is like 3.6 liters. Not very big. Um, the Mercury, when that came out, it got a 3 and 3 sixteenths bore, same stroke, so you had 239. And then Ford would use 239, basically, on through the end of production. The post-war Mercury's got a 4-inch crankshaft, so they were 255 cubic inches. That's why they're popular. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Orange crank, if yeah. you can get one of those. <laughs> okay, Kit Gerhardt wrote, Another. saying, it's going away, meaning the flathead, even in lawnmowers. Mm. My 42-year-old John Deere lawn tractor has a flathead, oh. though. Hey, God uh -oh. bless you. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just cool engines. They're... they're I mean, I feel like I could work on this easily myself. I could see myself lapping the valves. Yeah, very... I mean, it's, it's fun to work on. It's... Like I said, they they were the first engine that was really um, could sustain high speed driving. I mean, there weren't really interstates back then to get on and go. Mm -hmm. Turnpikes. Turnpikes. Everybody was a yeah. turnpiker, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> back in those days, yep. But a car. Imagine going from a Model T to something that'll do 80 miles an hour or better. Like that's insane, right? Yeah. In an in yeah. an everyday car. Yeah. 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 And they also made in starting in 37, at least in the U.S. 37 to 40. One, they had the V860, it was called. It was the economy car engine. So these were rated at 85 horsepower, but they went and re-engineered a completely different engine. Same basic configuration, but 136 cubic inches. And it looks like it fits in a shoebox, but it's mm. a flathead V8, same you know, layout of the valves and everything, but they called it the Thrifty 60, and it put out 60 horsepower. And they were popular in the midget uh, racers oh, and oh, yeah, sure, yeah. hydroplanes. It's right, a right, small, right. lightweight yeah. engine that uh -huh. would rev really high. And because, like, out of the factory, I've seen a video from the Rouge where they were dyno testing these. They had them on a tachometer showing, like, 4,500 RPM, which for the time is, is yeah. massively is fast. Fast, exactly. And with, you know, if you build them up with an aftermarket mm -hmm. cam and a dual carb intake, you can take them to 55, six grand, whatever. They'll, they'll spin. Lost in the curve and wrote oh. to say, 100 years from now, they'll claim aliens built that Oh, thing. maybe, <laughs> yeah, right? It's so, like, weird. <laughs> but it, so the, the flathead, like I mentioned, I think uh, it was around until the 90s in France. But really... The 60s. No, no the 90s. 90s. They used 90s. them into the 1990s in military trucks. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
And they had like... Thrifty. They're very economical, right? And they want a reliable, a smooth, a torquey engine gear. Yeah, that anybody can work on. They, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even the French mechanics. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, We're so used they, to Peugeots and Citrons. <laughs> But uh, really, for the flathead, it was game over in 55 because uh, small block Chevy. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, the, dominated the market. Well, exactly, right? I mean, arguably so Ed, the Ed best Cole, day ever. Ed Cole trumped him. Yes, boom. That's right. Boom. Kicked was, him to the curb. Was oh. certainly one of the okay, best. Okay, ever, ever they're still listening. More Everett Mitch said yeah, his 66 year old IHC Farmall Cub okay. also has a flathead. Mm. So I'm guessing Good. that's a, a tractor. Yeah. Yeah. So right. Ford actually used them. Small, the, small tractor, little um, one. And uh, tractor. The V8? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they did. Mm -hmm. I know they make a conversion kit. You can put a, an 85 horse yeah. in you, like your 8N tractor. I don't know why you would need that. It would be terrifying. They had one of those uh, tractors oh, that I've designed. Here we got the oh, Farmall tractor up there. There, there it is. There, there it is. is. That's a photo. That's Farm beautifully you can, restored. You can buy, yeah. you can buy it. And <laughs> yeah. Get another engine. There you go. Kit Gerhardt writes in to say, a friend has a Ford 60 on a stand in his garage. Oh, cool. I think it has cast iron pistons. Is that right? Yes, they did have cast iron pistons. It, it seems random depending on the year, but they had some did come with cast iron pistons hmm. or cast steel pistons even. Hmm. I don't know why. And some of the blocks from the same middle, this middle era, like, you know, 41 and up to 48, uh, they have what they call tin can sleeves. So basically, each bore has like, um, I don't know the thickness, 20 thousandths, 40 thousandths, something like that, a sleeve pressed into the block. And the idea was, once that engine reached the end of its service life, a home mechanic could pull those sleeves out, buy the next oversized set of pistons, drop them in, and run it. Oh. Like pre-rebuilt, pre basically, right? <laughs> oh. like, and there are these little, these tiny little thin steel sleeves that are in there. You can pull them out and get the next set of pistons. It's like. <laughs> They're designed to be worked on by farmers, right? Yeah. That's sort of the Model well, that, T legacy. Right? Well, no, the, the Henry Ford really cool. legacy, yeah. you know? Yeah. He, was, he was courting farmers as much as anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah he loved farmers. Like the, I, I, he was one. I remember uh, uh, an old mailman that we had that would come to our house, and I was working on an engine way back when I was at my parents' house, and he said uh, that Model T's, you'd set the points and the spark plug gap with a kitchen knife. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. It's close yeah. enough, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. And just like, think with the uniformity of kitchen knives back oh, then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kitchen yeah. knife standard, yeah. yeah. That's uh, right. But like the, the points in here, you just set them with a feeler gauge. You can get a, you can get a whole machine that'll tell you exactly when they're opening mm. and every, every spark plug is firing. Or you just get a feeler gauge that's between 15 thousandths and 16 thousandths. And you just get them at their widest point, mm -hmm. put the feeler gauge in, adjust these backer plates, done. Easy. Just like we always use. I still have feeler, <laughs> feeler gauges in my toolbox, but I bet I haven't had them out of there in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you need when's them, the you need When's the last time you had them out? Like yesterday? Well, <laughs> or maybe this morning. <laughs> just get a kitchen yeah. knife. There you go. Yeah. Easy, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Done. Okay, let's wrap it up because uh, the crew wants to go home. Well, too bad. Yeah. We're still talking. <laughs> yeah. You go back there and tell them that. Yeah, yeah. Just go ahead. Well, you already, you, poor Carmen has to go through now and bleep your cursing. Gary, yeah. I hope you're happy. <laughs> this is a family show. Yeah. Okie dokie. All right, are we offline?